Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech University Libraries. Um, and this is Archival Adventures, our weekly show from Special Collections and University Archives. Uh, I am streaming live both to uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the library's channel, and twitch.tv slash Rogan27, which is my personal channel. Um, and that is just honestly to reach more people. Uh, hello was not worth it, and Hannah, um, welcome in. It's good to see you both. Um, let's see. I will be uh, starting with our traditional reading of the um, land acknowledgement and labor acknowledgement. Uh, that is something I typically do here. Also, hang on one second before I get to that. I realize that I'm still on emote only on this channel. Um, all right, you should be able to chat now with more than emotes. Um, and we also did just get a raid from 16-bit Eric. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, Whimsies. Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. Um, if you are new here, uh, you have just raided into the channel of Rogan27, which is me. I am also Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And this program is a program I do once a week where I share materials from the archives at Special Collections and University Archives in the library at Virginia Tech. So welcome in. Today we'll be looking at some stuff from sort of early internet history. Uh, the collection we're looking at today is the Blacksburg Electronic Village Collection. Um, so welcome everyone. Hi, Cy Martini. Welcome in. Just here for coffee, Fluid Ann. Um, it's always a pleasure having Eric bring the whimsies by. Uh, you all know me from just being active over in his chat and um, watching him and the things that he does regularly. Um, so it's lovely when you all stop by. It's, it's good to see familiar faces in the, in the audience here. Hi, DJ Phoenix and Eagle Sight. Um, <laughs> It, it does feel somewhat like a theater tech booth, but I also see like the zoom on the camera is out and so you can actually see um, the two computers uh, <laughs> where I um, where I control the two different streams. It requires two separate computers to run the two streams. I could run them both from the same one, but the captions will only go to one stream or the other in that case. So two computers. Um, and as always, this is a live setup that we have to physically set up every week and, you know, we'll, we'll adjust. In future, I'll remember that it's supposed to be zoomed in a little bit more so that you see less of what's going on here, but it's fine. Um, I do want to do <laughs> hacker voice. I'm in. Uh, I, I have, um, our labor and land acknowledgement, um, the official one for the university that I like to read at the beginning of each stream because I think it's important to pay attention to what the university is saying about these things and to hold them accountable to their commitments. So I'm just going to read that real quick. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to ut prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So I think it's important to hear those words, pay attention to what they say, the explicit commitments listed therein, and hold the institution accountable for uh, living up to those commitments. So I, I find it beneficial to repeat them every week on this program. 
pay no attention to the screens er, in front of the man. Yes, just here for coffee. Um, I mean, it's fine. <clears throat> we have computers that run the stream. I don't think that's a surprise. The brand of the computers, eh, I would prefer that we don't give free advertising. But also, you know, we are a uh, public institution. Um, these computers were ultimately, ultimately purchased with public funds, and so I don't think it's a big secret what we buy. Um, <laughs> uh, it is not the Pike pin. This is uh, the Caleb Widowgast pin this week. <laughs> also, I'm, I'm surprisingly yellow, which I think has to do with the, col the, the temperature of the lighting this week, which uh, last week was the same setting, but for some reason was less yellow. I don't know. We're going to roll with it. Um, also, I am now aware, of which I was not last week, that both of these computers refuse to be changed from central time. They have decided that they need to run on central time and will not change their clocks, which is why last week I ran over by an hour because I didn't realize it was as late as it was because the computers were telling me it, the time in central time. Um, and I'm in Eastern time. So I ended last week at 6 p.m. when I thought I was ending at 5 p.m. Um, and now I know why. Anyway. Today, we are going to be looking at the Blacksburg Electronic Village Collection. And <laughs> yeah, it was not worth it. It was a surprise to me, to say the least. I'm going to pull up the finding aid for this, and we're going to start there. Uh, just to get a little background on what the Blacksburg Electronic Village I is, uh, was, and what we can expect to find in this collection. And I will show you this web page once I get it up. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. All right. Hi, Scraff. <laughs> um, yeah, the, this is what the setup looks like every week. We're just um, not zoomed in as much as uh, in the past. Um, so you all get a, a little sneak peek behind the, uh, behind the scenes. All right. So now you should have a view of the finding aid. Um, the finding aids for our manuscript collections are located on virginiaheritage.org. That is, um, it, if you go to the website VA Heritage, V A H E R I T A G E dot O R G, um, the finding aid is there. A sneak peek behind the motherboard, so to speak. Indeed, indeed. Um, and actually, I'm just going to grab this and drop this in chat for you all. So that if you wish to visit the finding aid yourself, uh, you can do so. Um, sorry, you really just got a sneak peek. I forgot I was sharing that screen. <laughs> I haven't I haven't shared the finding aid uh, on stream in a few sessions because I've been focusing on other things from our collections. Um, and you can tell this is all streamlined and super professional, and I have an entire team of people helping me produce this. I don't. Um, I do have some very good helpers. I have um, a student moderator in chat. I have uh, some of our other library staff that help support the stream. But otherwise, this is very much um, <clears throat> a very few person operation here. All right, the, the Blacksburg Electronic Village Collection, uh, covering the years 1992 to 2006. Um, if you need me to increase the size, do let me know in chat, because um, I can do that. Um, hi, Millie Glitch. Um, all right. 
Let's see what we have here. Historical information. And uh, one second, I'm going to refresh this so that we don't have the highlighted words. It likes to highlight search terms, but we don't need that when we're, we're looking at it this way. It's fine. OK. Um, oh, and do I have the captions on? I don't think I do. I apologize for that. Um, captions are a go. So much, uh, so much distract happening in my brain today. Uh, um, Scraff, we do have documents. So uh, I will be sharing documents in a moment. Right now, we're looking at the description of the collection itself. Um, so this online library that uh, that I dropped the the link in is. Um, that's Virginia Heritage, uh, which is just where the finding aids are housed. And finding aids are the descriptions that the archivists write for the materials that are in collections. They're intended to help uh, researchers locate um, what they're looking for. So if you uh, say we're doing research on internet history and you went to Virginia Heritage and you searched uh, based on search terms. This is one of the collections that could pop up and then you would know that you wanted to come to Virginia Tech to access these materials um, in this collection. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, but it's just going to give us a little bit of the, the history so that we're all kind of starting with a little bit of base knowledge about what um, Blacksburg Electronic Village is. Um, when, we're, when we start looking at the documents that we have in the collection. So, uh, the concept of an online community network for Blacksburg, Virginia, originated in 1991. An outreach project of Virginia Tech, the Blacksburg Electronic Village would seek to bring internet access to the entire community. Collaborative efforts during the next two years among Virginia Tech, the town of Blacksburg, and Bell Atlantic of Virginia prepared the town's information infrastructure by installing digital switching equipment and a fiber backbone. The first beta test of BEV software, including internet, email, and gopher clients, occurred in spring 1993, and BEV was formally launched in October 1993. So, uh, if you're not familiar with internet history and you're just used to sort of the modern world, um, at the time, a lot of people just, like 1993, if you were accessing the internet from home, you were dialing in over a telephone line. Um, and what this project did was link up the whole area, this rural town of Blacksburg, where Virginia Tech is located, um, to fiber internet. Uh, like, that was the intent, was just give it to everybody, give everybody access to the internet. And we'll see, it's a little bit more than that. And um, this is one that I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the project. I don't know all the details. But this is really early and really innovative for the time. Um, linking individuals, government agencies, commercial enterprises, and community organizations through fiber optic technology, BEV was among the earliest online community networks and received international attention. By 1997, more than 80% of the community's residents had computers, many of them connected to the internet through Virginia Tech's modem pool, and Blacksburg was dubbed by the press the most wired town in America. By 1996, the Virginia Tech modem pool was becoming overloaded and users not affiliated with Virginia Tech were required to switch to inde independent internet providers. Today, BEV continues to work with local individuals, the town of Blacksburg, and nonprofit organizations, providing website development and support, email accounts, and civic websites, among other services. This collection contains materials relating to Blacksburg Electronic Village, an experimental online community network connecting individuals, government agencies, businesses, and organizations in Blacksburg, Virginia. The collection contains such materials as correspondence, BEV in-house publications, including brochures and fact sheets, presentations consisting largely of overhead transparencies, uh, clippings from magazines, newspapers, and newsletters, and a few reports issued by external organizations and agencies. 
So if you do want to explore the finding aid at all, I did drop that link in chat. You can look at the listings here of what is located in the folders by topic. So if there's one that you kind of just want me to pull out and look at specifically, do let me know in chat and I will prioritize getting that folder on stream. Um, now, uh, I want to see, and yes, I know you can see my Google here. Um, BEV.net is still a live website. Uh, so this is what Blacksburg Electronic Village looks like today. And if we go to their About Us, as an, it's very short. As an outreach project of Virginia Tech, the Blacksburg Electronic Village serves the local community. Please browse using the links above or visit our services page to find out more about the BEV. Um, they have a history page, uh, which is a lot of similar stuff to what we just saw. And we're going to look at some of their history directly. But if you go, um, so there's the home page, there's initiatives, um, new technology initiatives, things like that, uh, local links which has links to the mayor's blog, Blacksburg Village Square, which is the, um, the town's website, um, Progress and Maine, I'm not familiar with that personally, educational organizations, the local community college and other colleges in the area, um, links to the libraries, museums, etc. So local services, the village mall, uh, which I don't know if this is even still functional. It does look like it is. Bed and breakfasts. There are 17 bed and breakfasts in here, apparently. Um, so a local resource for local businesses. Um, which if you're familiar with the early internet, the pre-Google internet, so this is all developed about a decade before Google, um, this site in itself and the, the organization of it and the listing of things on it is very similar to that pre-Google internet um, and sort of the curated internet in the way that uh, Yahoo and other organizations um, tried to organize things and help people find things on the internet before Google kind of revolutionized how that was done. So, um, so yeah, that is what it looks like today, but we're going to look in documents and look at what it used to look like uh, and kind of the coverage. Um, at the time when Blacksburg, Virginia was known as the most wired town in America. So, we're gonna do sort of as, as I typically do, I'm just gonna start pulling things out um, and we'll flip through them and sort of explore them together. I've, I've looked through this a couple of times, but not really in depth. I haven't read a ton of the stuff in it. I've just it, previously had reason to look at this collection a couple of times. Um, so I'm not wholly unfamiliar with it, but I also don't know a lot of like the detail of what's in it. So um, it'll still be us experiencing it together for the first time. Uh, I just may have seen some of the items before. Um, but mostly me seeing them before would mean I've glanced at them while I was looking for something specific because I um, uh, was part of a project to put together a photograph book documenting the 150 years that Virginia Tech has been around um, and that will be coming. Uh, in fact, it, it is now listed on 
Amazon and Barnes and Noble uh, with a, an expected publication date of March 2022. So um, you know, as more becomes available, um, it's it's called uh, No Ordinary Moment, uh, Virginia Tech. 150 years in 150 images. I, I may have the subtitle wrong. I don't remember. It's no ordinary moment, um, and it's uh, a book that Special Collections is putting out for uh, Virginia Tech's sesquicentennial. Um, and I popped into this collection looking for an image to use uh, to talk about Blacksburg Electronic Village uh, as part of that history. But um, what we have here is from the folder, the very first folder, it's just titled Correspondence, 1992 to 1997. So let's see what some of these letters are. Town of Blacksburg, Resolution 2D92. A resolution establishing a procedure in connection with the possible renewal of the Blacksburg cable TV franchise. Whereas the town of Blacksburg's franchise with Booth American Company for the latter's provision of cable, com cable communication services to the town was granted for 30 years from January 4th, 1965 by Ordinance 294 adopted December 8th, 1964 as amended by resolution of the Blacksburg Town Council adopted January 11th, 1966 whereas this franchise expires January 4th, 1995, whereas Booth American Company has requested that the town initiate a federally prescribed process that may lead toward the possible renewal of this franchise. Therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Blacksburg that, one, the Council commences proceedings for the purpose of addressing these inquiries, a, in identifying the future cable-related community needs and interests of the Town of Blacksburg, and b, reviewing the performance of the cable operator Booth American Company under the franchise during the current franchise term. Two, the Council establishes that these proceedings shall be concluded by January 5, 1994. Three, the Council's Telecommunications Advisory Committee is respectfully requested to address these inquiries to address other and innovative telecommunications needs of the town as they may relate to the possibility of the cable communications franchise renewal to conduct at least one administrative public hearing thereon and to report to the Council the results of these efforts by January 5th, 1993. Not much more in the resolution. I know governmental resolutions may not be the most entertaining, uh, but I think it's worth looking at. Four, the Town Council shall review the report of the Telecommunications Advisory Committee, conduct at least one public hearing thereon, and by resolution act upon this report to either affirm, reject, or amend the findings in the report. Council shall take this action by January 5th, 1994. Five. Town Council shall immediately communicate its findings as set out in the resolution to Booth American Company and indicate in the communication such material as the town may require, including proposals for an upgrade of the cable system. Uh, in any proposal that Booth American Company may then submit to the town for the renewal of the franchise. Any proposal that may be submitted shall be submitted by April 1st, 1994. Uh, signed Roger E. Hedgepeth, Mayor. <coughs> Uh, attested by Donna Boone Cal Caldwell, town clerk, date of adoption February 11th, 1992. So, relevant because BEV ultimately needed um, a completely new infrastructure to be able to deliver the internet services. Let's see. Ninety-five, a congratulatory letter. Let's see what what do we have? What do we have? <laughs> this one's this one's kind of fun, um, if for no other reason than the formation of some of the words. Uh, d November seventeenth, nineteen ninety-five, on Citizens Telephone Cooperative letterhead. Uh, this is actually a fax. Um, I know that because. At the top, you have the fax header information. Um, the original probably wasn't a fax, but this is a faxed copy of a letter. Ms. Courtney Martin, Blacksburg Electronic Village. 
Dear Ms. Martin, I am pleased to announce that Citizens Telephone Cooperative now offers access to the internet without toll charges in Montgomery, Roanoke, and Floyd County. To ensure service quality and speed on the internet, Citizens has established a direct T1 backbone connection, which at the time was ridiculously fast. Citizens Internet service will be offered with a variety of access plans and rates. Enclosed is a schedule of our rates, business office numbers, and additional information about the Internet. Citizens Telephone Cooperative, Cooperative has been in existence for over 40 years. We have assembled a team of dedicated and knowledgeable employees who are ready, willing, and able to provide the best telecommunication service today and in the future. Over the next few years, more competition will be introduced in the telecommunication industry. Citizens plans to be a competitive provider of all broadband communication services, data, voice, and video in this area with the latest state-of-the-art facilities. <clears throat> T1 was basically what standard cable speeds are now, built for businesses. Yes, like you wouldn't be getting a T1 line in your home, except through BEV, you could. Uh, should you have questions about the new internet service, please give us a call or contact us at our internet address, citizens at swva.net. Please note that this is an address correction that is being made effective today to, due to the confusion with NRVNet. Please call me upon receipt of this letter. Yours very truly, James R. Newell, General Manager. So, 1995, <clears throat> we have the word internet with net all capitalized, and it is itself capitalized as a word. So, that, that word has evolved over time to the point now where um, Typically, it's just written with small letters all throughout as one word, internet. Um, but this, this was early formulation of the word internet. Um, later, it would still remain capitalized, but the net would be lowercase. Um, I still capitalize internet informal writing as well, Millie Glitch, just because it was drilled into me that that was the proper way and that it was a proper noun and required capitalization. Um, but it has become more and more common to not require it to be capitalized, and I've seen some style guides that um, specify that it should be lowercase all throughout. But in 95, this was proper formulation of the word internet. Um, you also have broadband, uh, and this is actually listed as two words here. I know it has a line break, but this is not just a broken word, at the time broadband was two words, whereas today broadband is a single word. Uh, so just interesting to look at that. Also, um, at our internet address, which today we would refer to as an email address or an email. So I just think it's fun to look at that um, and sort of see just how the language has evolved since then. Uh, citizens offers access to the internet without toll charges. Uh, citizens offers access to the internet without toll charges. This service will allow local calls to connect to the internet with a variety of access plans and rates. This service will utilize 28.8 KBOD modems on an 8 to 1 ratio for standard service. The, to ensure service quality and speed, Citizens is establishing a direct T1 backbone connection. This new internet service will be connected on a first come, first serve basis. The business office numbers uh, are listed. Um, their account setup fee was $19.95. Account setup with software, $44.95. Monthly rate schedule. Local dial-up access, 28.8 uh, kilobytes per second modem speed, modem ratio 12 to 1. Entry level, 10 hours of access a month, $10.95. Additional time, 
per hour, $2.89 an hour. Basic access, 30 hours of access to the internet per month for $19.95 with any additional time charged at $2.49 an hour. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's not uh, fee-free. It is, it is definitely uh, a pay-for-service model. Um, but this was, this was revolutionary um, at the time just to, to have this, especially in a small town. Um, Local dial-up access, 28.8 .8 kilobytes per second modem speed, modem ratio 8 to 1. Uh, standard 50 hours of access for $24.95 a month. Enhanced 100 hours of access. Who would need 100, of, 100 hours of access to the internet per month? $49.95 because what are you doing that you need access to the internet for a hundred hours a month? Um, super access, which is unlimited time. Unheard of. Unlimited internet access? $99.95 a month. Local dial-up access at 28.8 kilobytes per second modem speed with a dedicated modem. So the, the previous here, the least expensive, 12 to 1 modem ratio. So 12 users, one modem receiving, meaning you're competing with 11 other people to get onto the internet. Modem ratio 8 to 1, meaning you're competing with seven other people to connect to the internet because you have to be able to dial into that modem, and if somebody else is already using it, you can't dial into it. At least that's how I'm reading it. Correct me if you know better. Um, but then here you have local dial-up access with an, a dedicated modem, meaning there is a modem waiting for you at the modem hub that you connect to directly, and nobody else uses that modem. Uh, unlimited time is the only level with that, <clears throat> $199.95 a month. Dedicated high speed access circuits. So this is getting a direct line. You're not using telephone, you are getting uh, an internet line put through to your place. Uh, 56 kilobytes in individual unlimited access, $549.95 a month. Uh, and for 64 kilobytes or 128 kilobytes, uh, you have to contact them for pricing. You remember staying with friends in Idaho in 99 and you had three separate accounts running with 150 hours each. <laughs> I mean, but this was, this was early internet. This was 95. Like, who would need 100, 100 hours a month on the internet? World Wide Web page hosting service. Space is available on Citizen's server to host your www page. Page development service and assistance is available on a fee basis. There will be a $200 one-time fee that includes posting your www pages and any associated files on Citizen's server. The fee covers the administration of the page and registering of the page with the different sites on the web. One page update per month is included at no charge. One page update per month. Additional monthly, because in 95, web pages were intended to be static things that changed rarely. <clears throat> Ad additional monthly updates are $50 each. $50. If you make a mistake in your update and you need to update it again, $50. The monthly usage fee includes 30 megabytes of storage on the Citizens WWW server. Additional storage space is available at $30 per 30 megabyte block. Usage is based on the amount of data transferred to the, to the viewer. The amount of data transferred will depend on the number of times the page is accessed. The number of access hits is a measure of how many times your page is viewed. The size of your page will also determine, and it's cut off from there, but um, 
They even sold web design services, yeah. Regarding the modem ratios, if memory serves, you might not necessarily be competing with a set group of eight to 10 people, but for that access number, they only keep enough modems available to accommodate that many concurrent connections. Thank you, Just Here for Coffee. That makes more sense that they could only accommodate 12 connections at once or eight connections at once using that number. But it was possible to try and connect to the internet and get a busy signal because too many people were connected. Um, that was, that was a thing that happened. Um, it was also a regular occurrence to connect to the internet and get disconnected because somebody in your house picked up the, the telephone to go and make a call and them picking up that telephone disrupted your internet connection. <laughs> that was definitely a thing, TM. Look at those prices. Looks at the multi-gig video files I just moved. Yikes! <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so here we have a uh, communication from January of 96 titled Radford Electronic Village. Radford is um, a town, two towns over. Uh, it is the home of Radford University, which at one point in time in the history of this area uh, was the Women's College of Virginia Tech. Um, before that, it was Radford College. Uh, and so it is just it, now it's Radford University, which is a separate institution. Uh, and Radford, the town, is where that is located. And so it's geographically close. It's like maybe a half hour drive. Um, if World of Warcraft existed back then, you'd be paying extreme amounts of money to just be connected. Yes, and the thing is, dial-up services, um, <laughs> if you've been paying attention to the news at all lately, you've, you've seen the rebranding of Facebook uh, or its reorganization under a corporate structure titled Meta, and um, the fact that there was mention of something called the metaverse, which uh, virtual world, things like that. Virtual worlds started during the dial-up era. Um, Second Life was one of the first ones, and it was active during the dial-up era. You could connect and use that virtual world over a dial-up connection. Uh, but World of Warcraft would, would definitely have been a very different experience on dial-up. So in 96, four years after the start of Blacksburg Electronic Village, uh, we have this memo, the city of Radford now has an opportunity to provide the leadership in developing an electronic community similar to Blacksburg Electronic Village. Uh, this will enhance the quality of people's lives by eventually electronically linking the residents of the city to each other. <clears throat> to city and community information sources and to worldwide networks. No one group or organization can create an electronic village. There must be strong support from across the community and key players must include the local government, the local library, and public schools. By way of this memo, I would request your support and ask that this be an action item on our January 8th, 1996 agenda. So this was to the Radford City Council. Attached to it is the Nielsen Internet Survey. Um, if you're familiar with Nielsen ratings, uh, which is the the system used to provide ratings uh, for television um, so that networks know how many people are watching given shows. <clears throat> this is the same company. Um, <laughs> you remember Second Life? I explored in there a lot. I didn't go on very much. Came out in 2003. It was transitioning from dial-up into cable internet. That is true. Um, but it was in the ADSL era, easily, which freed up your phone line for calls. Yeah, it was, um, 
<clears throat> it was certainly during that transitional period, um, but all of the usage that I did on Second Life, the only times I ever accessed it was dial-up. Um, and it was possible to use. They had it structured in such a way that you could use it over dial-up. <coughs> um, Following our highlights of a survey of internet use in the U.S. and Canada released by Nielsen Media Research October 30th. So this is attached to that 96 memo. <clears throat> Number of internet users. People who had access to internet services. 37 million people, or 17% of the general population. People who had used the internet during the previous three months. 24 million, or 11% of the general population. People who had used the Multimedia World Wide Web service, 18 million or 8% of the general population. Because the reason that is listed the way that it is, <clears throat> mentioning people who had used the Multimedia World Wide Web service, we hear World Wide Web today and we're like, oh yeah, that's just the internet. World Wide Web was a specific multimedia service. It was not the only way to connect to the internet. Um, in fact, it was quite common in early internet days to dial into a bulletin board service that was just maintained on a server computer in somebody's basement. And the people you interacted there with there were the other people that dialed into that server computer um, to connect to that bulletin board system. And a bulletin board system, uh, for anybody who's not familiar, would have been something similar to, uh, say, like a Slack channel um, or a Discord server, uh, where it's a specific community of individuals who connect to it, they have usernames on there, there are different um, channels where you can chat about different things, uh, you can post messages, etc. Played in Second Life, but didn't do much. I did meet someone in there who was part of the Second Life beta. Cool. Yeah, bulletin boards are like a forum, but not as intuitive. Key squared, I barely remember Gopher. <laughs> but yes, Gopher was, um, was another uh, service. Uh, and there were there were other things. So there was World Wide Web, there was Gopher, there was one that was a spider. I don't remember what it was called, but they, there were various um, like search methodologies. There was um, Ask Jeeves, um, Yahoo, uh, I can't remember everything. Web Crawler, thank you. Usenet, um, yeah, early internet pre-Google, really, had various ways of organizing itself. <clears throat> People who had purchased products or services over the World Wide Web, 13% of web users in the US, or 2.5 million people as of 96, had purchased items over the internet. Frequency of internet use. People who access the internet every day, 7.5 million or 31% of internet users in the US and Canada. Average length of time per week that internet users spent online, five hours and 28 minutes. Profile of internet users. Gender of internet users, 66% male, 34% female. Proportion of internet users between the ages of 16 and 34, 53% of all users. Proportion of internet users with incomes exceeding $80,000 per year, 25% of all users. In the general population in the US and Canada, 10% had incomes exceeding $80,000 per year. <clears throat> so disproportionately, those people were on the internet. Proportion of internet users with a college degree, 64% compared with 28% of the general population. Back when sending your credit card in plain text via email was normal. Yep. Encryption was not as big a deal back then. That is for certain.
my brain had, uh, I looked at the, I, I don't know why the clocks are wrong on the computers. I was like, wait, these clocks are telling me that it is before I started. <laughs> and my brain took a second to adjust to that. Um, let's see. I want to actually look at some of the actual, so these are our memos. Oh, this one's good. We'll look at this one and then we'll move on to the next folder. <clears throat> this one I had noted previously. July 14th, 1997. Rapid Access International. Dr. Andrew, Andrew Cohill, director, Blacksburg Electronic Village, regarding Blacksburg Electronic Village in Japanese press. Dear Dr. Cohill, I am writing on behalf of Steve Norwood to thank you again for your assistance with, your, with our research on the Blacksburg Electronic Village and to forward you a copy of the journal article as it was published. Steve Norwood's Blacksburg article was published in the May 1997 issue of the Japanese journal uh, Jichi, uh, Jishitai Johoka Repoto, Local Government Computerization Report. I have translated the journal's cover page, the article's title page, and the captions of the pictures for you. I hope you enjoy it. It was well received in Japan. <clears throat> By way of background, the Jichitai Joh Jichitai Johoka Repoto is a publication of the ja Japan Management Association Research Institute, JMAR. JMAR is one of the largest research institutes in Japan and has special expertise in public policy that is targeted to local and municipal government leaders in Japan. The journal's circulation is presumably significant given JMAR's extensive membership in Japan. Thank you again for your assistance, and if you would like any further information, please do not hesitate to contact me at the numbers above. <laughs> yeah, uh, Millie, I'm, I am, I have extremely little practice trying to pronounce any Japanese words. Whether, uh, so, <clears throat> thankfully, part of this has been uh, translated for me. J Japanese is not a language that I have uh, attempted. <clears throat> Local Government Computerization Report Computerization Case Studies May 1997, Volume 1, Number 2 Online Community, Blacksburg Electronic Village U.S. Report Toward Cyber Village, an experiment in Yamada Village. Interview, Residence and Computer Literacy, Mr. Muto, uh, Keio University. Series, one, Government and Computerization, Barriers to Local Government Computerization, Mr. Furukawa, uh, Tsukuba University. Series, Local Government and Benchmarking. Current USIT News, Website, American Residence Network. Basic terminology, computerization research, and citizens' views. <clears throat> Online community, Blacksburg Electronic Village. <laughs> but then, like, the actual text is not translated, so I can't read it because I don't read Japanese. Sorry. Um, but it would be very interesting to have this actually translated. The... And this, this also, I think, was faxed. Either that or it's just a really bad photocopy of a printed journal. Um, we get uh, some graphics in there. It would be interesting to get an actual, like, real copy of this journal to add to the collection. I think that would be pretty neat. Um, Main Street, Blacksburg. They have an image of Main Street. Looks very similar today, honestly. The cars look a bit newer today. Oh, the London Underground. It's not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> residential area in Blacksburg. It's a picture of some houses in a suburban setting. Um,
So I just thought it was really cool that in 97, in a uh, public policy journal in Japan, they were writing about this project. Virginia Tech Burris Hall, Virginia Tech campus. And it's actually a lengthy article here. <clears throat> the caption to this picture, students apartments are on the network. And I don't know, Melba, are you in chat today? Melba might not be here. I was um, one of our regular viewers as a Virginia Tech alum, and so I was gonna, I was gonna ask about their experience. I don't know when they attended, so I don't know. I don't know if they have ever heard of Blacksburg Elect Electronic Village. Um, okay. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. I can't actually read that article to you because I don't read Japanese. Uh, but it would, be, it would be very interesting to get it um, translated and kind of see what's there. Let's see if I can get this. Uh, it doesn't look like Melba's in chat today. That's OK. <laughs> There's no expectation that people show up regularly or at all honestly it's I'm very grateful whenever people show for the show <laughs> having you all here to kind of look at these things with me and chat about them is is quite fun for me and hopefully entertaining for you uh, let's see promotional publications network briefing book community-based broadband telecommunications infrastructure um, 2001, I want some early stuff. Blacksburg Electronic Village, The Missing Years, 1979 through 1993. Let's see what's in here. <clears throat> All right, last revised April 7th, 2006 by Matthew Mathai and so this is a paper. Let me look at one thing real quick before I read this on air. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to read part of it at least. Much has been written about the Blacksburg Electronic Village beginning with its launch in October 1993 and thereafter. This document traces the origins of BEV. In keeping the paper brief, I'm certain I've failed to acknowledge the contributions of many volunteers and paid staff members who worked diligently to make the BEV a reality. These omissions in no way diminish the value of their efforts or dedication. I just want to kind of skim a little bit here, uh, maybe get the introduction and, and what this author wrote about the background, because I think that's the main focus of this is, how did it come about? October 2003 marked the 10th anniversary of the launch of Blacksburg Electronic Village. The thinking that led to the formation of the BEV, or Community Information Utility, as it was referred to then began over a decade prior to that, around 1979, in the Environmental Design and Planning Program in Virginia Tech's College of Architecture. The group consisting of faculty members Bob Hetrick, uh, Len Simutis, Al Stice, ben, or Bev Yannick, and Dick Zodi also included Irv Blythe, Associate Director of the Computing Center, who was enrolled in the graduate program at the time. This group tossed around the idea of a community-centric, network-accessible set of products and services. Hetrick and Blythe 
discussed ideas from a book called Planning Community Information Utilities by Harold Sackman that helped them realize the potential power of community networks. Though Hetrick was quick to point out that their musings in 1979 could not be credited with being the precursor to BEV, the seed obviously was sown back then. Absolutely, Hannah, if you want to talk about what you're working on while enjoying the stream, I'm happy to see those posts. It's nice to know that you enjoy um, some time, uh, or, or it's nice to know what you're working on when you're watching the stream. Um, ooh, yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> so there are some papers at the beginning here, uh, written papers with documented histories of it. Here I have a presentation. Appalachian Healthcare Conference presentation, 1997. Um, <laughs> this is weird to be presenting somebody else's presentation. Uh, especially when I don't have their presentation notes, nor have I seen their presentation. Uh, but we'll give it a go and, and look at what their slides look like. <laughs> so we've got, these are Blacksburg Electronic Village slide deck, essentially. Um, although this was before PowerPoint presentations were really a thing. Uh, so these are for overhead projectors. Um, universal access, Goal, goals of the project, universal access. Everyone in the community, regardless of their economic or educational background, should have access to the network. Equality of access. Everyone in the community should be able to participate in a community network, including local government, civic groups, citizens, and businesses. At a glance, 36,000 residents in the town. 50% have an IP address at home or at work. 62% have email. Well over 2,000 distinct personal and business homes or home pages. Over two thirds of businesses in town advertising on the internet and over 400 known web servers. So this is five years into the project when this presentation was given. So it launched in 92, this presentation was from 95, or sorry, 97. Um, and they had 50% of the residents in town that had an IP address either at home or at work. 62% of them had an email uh, well over 2,000 distinct personal and business home pages, um, and two-thirds of the businesses in town were advertising on the internet in 97. That is unusual. That is actually detailing a success for this program. So this was, uh, again, for, for the Appalachian Healthcare Conference. So we have a slide here. Uh, this is not in order. I don't know, we just went from slide two to slide four, and now we're at slide 11. Um, I don't know where the missing slides are, but this one's actual transparency. This one was for, for the overhead projector. Ask the cardiologist. Partial funding from an educational grant by Merck and Company. 343 hits since February 17th. Uh, 56 questions submitted as of March 18th, 97. Fifth answer now posted. A new answer is posted once or twice weekly. J. Edwin Wilder, MD, a local cardiologist, answers questions related to the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. So this would have been part of the intent of the project was to connect the community online. So by going to this site, this curated portion of the internet and sending a question to the Ask a Cardiologist page, you could trust that the answer you would get was from a local medical professional. 
Whereas if you go today out onto the internet and Google a medical question, there are numerous dubious websites that provide answers. Here, it was a local medical professional, somebody whose office you could potentially go to if it became clear from their answer that you had a medical concern and needed to see somebody. So an actual doctor who you could potentially go to for an appointment would be answering your medical question on this community network online. It's a local curated internet rather than just the World Wide Web, uh, the global internet where you can't trust what's being said because you don't have the means to adequately verify um, and hold accountable the person who posted it. Use of online health issue, er, info. Online physicians serve as expert consultants and facilitators. They typically answer questions related to medications, diagnostic procedures, and, and treatment. They also advise whether certain symptoms need to be investigated and consistently encourage a closer consultation between the patient and the personal, personal physician. What experienced online self-helpers find most useful is direct one-to-one -one responses to their own questions and responses to the questions of others who share their concerns. Let's see. Uh, use of online health info continued. Online resources ranked by perceived value to online self-helpers. One, responses to my own questions by knowledgeable persons, either clinicians or self-helpers or both. Two, uh, two, <laughs> oh, they have two items tied for second, I get it. Answers to questions asked by other self-helpers like myself with answers by knowledgeable persons, either clinicians or self-helpers or both. Uh, also, results of my own searches for information. Um, this is perceived value. Four, typical professionally generated patient education materials, typically pre-existing printed pamphlets and articles put up on the web. And this last item is ranked much lower than those above. So they value the interpersonal interactions um, or the results of their own work over the pre-printed published materials, apparently. I think that rings true today as well except that a lot of the results of their own research today would be searching forums and posts by other people online. Internet education. The Blacksburg Electronic Village and the Student Health Service at Virginia Tech have been working together in a campus community partnership. The program has been approved for 3.5 continuing medical education credits for physicians and 4.2 contact hours for registered nurses. Description an intensive half-day class that provided a complete introduction to the internet and how it can be used as a tool for health professionals seeking increased access to current information and research, interaction with other practitioners, clinical journals, guidelines for practice, patient handouts, continuing medical and nursing education. 97, they were just putting together continuing education courses to teach people how to use the internet. October 29th, 1996. Let's see, this is a thank you for agreeing to speak at the Appalachian Healthcare Conference. <clears throat> and it asks specifically for them to address the development and maintenance of community networks like Blacksburg Electronic Network. In particular, please inform the audience of the consumer orientation of BEV how it is made accessible to a broad range of public interests, including healthcare, if you have per, 
uh, progressed to that point by March, could you explain how the effort to expand the health information function has developed, including the chats via real audio with physicians? The Lewis Gale Medical FAQ and the Merck Cardiovascular Project. Each of these stem from the active consumer's interest for more health information, something you might close by explaining to the community responsive and low-tech nature of your health efforts. So 1996-97, BEV was hosting live audio calls over the internet. Cutting edge. Voice over IP was not a thing in 97, except it was here. According, according to this, the live chats via real audio. And real audio here is, is written as a name, a product name. Uh, let me see what I can learn about that for you. I mean, this is, I know about Real Audio Player. Real Audio is a pr proprietary audio format developed by, by Real Networks and first released in 1995. Uh, had its own set of codecs ranging from low bitrate formats that could be used over dial-up modems to high fidelity formats for music. Okay, so it would have been possible to have actual like live audio conversations um, using their audio codecs on dial-up modems. I didn't know that. I only knew real. Uh, I, I knew real audio from music. I had real real player on my computer to play music to play CDs that I stuck in my CD drive in my computer. I don't know if it was recordings. It's just a reference in the acceptance to give a presentation. I, I, that's the first time I've come across any reference to that in this collection. It could be buried somewhere else in the collection and I just don't know about it. Um, it would be very interesting to research that and find out exactly how they were doing those uh, real audio chats with medical professionals. <laughs> Changing systems of care in the 90s. Notes from the conference. I'm just looking to see if there's specifically any mention in here of the program given on BEV, lots of doctors listed. <laughs> uh, looking, I didn't see it at a glance and I'm not going to spend a lot of time searching, uh, but it's, we have notes from the conference uh, if somebody wanted to come in and use the collection and look through them uh, to learn more about that conference. We have that. <clears throat> Let's see. I do want to get to some of the magazine coverage as well, if, if I can. Translating, translating. Every time I look at the clock on the computer, my brain buffers. <laughs> because I have to remember that the clock is wrong. Um, Abingdon, Virginia presentation. Apparently there was a note on the original folder. It has been uh, put into an archival folder, uh, an acid-free archival folder. And so the archivist preserved the note from the original folder. Apparently someone had written on the folder, important early network architecture design of the BEV. I, this item is undated, uh, but apparently it was early network architecture, so I'm assuming closer to the beginning of the 1990s, 
then to the end of the 90s. <clears throat> Again, we have transparencies for use in presenting, but we also have the same pages produced on regular paper here. Abingdon statistics. So Abingdon, Virginia, uh, which because I'm live on the internet, I'm not going to say where it is without looking it up to confirm. Uh, especially because this is being recorded and while my brain thinks it knows where Abingdon is, I'm just going to confirm. Right. Abingdon is in the southwestern part of Virginia near the North Carolina border. Um, not too far from Bristol. So in the mountains, southwest Virginia. Washington County, Virginia, total population of 48,000, countywide, 15 K through 12 schools in the county, one four-year school, Emory and Henry, one community college, Virginia Highlands. Abingdon Information Utility. Internet feed goes into the town. The town acts as a broker for all public and private internet users. Local municipal internet infrastructure that goes out to the local schools, the colleges and libraries, and local businesses. Costs for service. One-time equipment costs 75000 multi-port router, at least 18 ports, hub for city hall, T1 line equipment. Internet feed for the town, $48,000 per year or $4,000 a month. Support technician, $30,000 a year or $2,500 a month. Total monthly cost to the town, $6,500. Uh, $6, <clears throat> Customers for service. Private modem pool provider, $1,000 per month. Public schools, 15 of them, times $300 per school, $4,500 per month. Colleges, two schools, times $300 a month, $600 a month. Public libraries, three of them, at $300 a month for $900 a month. Small businesses, six, six small businesses in town, $500 a month for service, $3,000 a month total. Total monthly revenue, $10,000. So that's a profit for the town of roughly $4,000 or $3,500. Monthly costs, $6,500. Debt financing at $2,500 a month. Monthly income, $10,000. So surplus, profit of $1,000 a month. Once you deal with paying off the debt, Outreach activities, classes to teach community groups about community networks. Mastering the internet for anyone who needs basic skills, one or two days. Planning a community network for community leaders and citizens, a half a day course. Design of a community network for project leaders and content providers, one and a half days. <clears throat> community information management for community website managers, content providers, two days. Education, not technology. Community networks are about communication, not technology. Technology products, projects are doomed to failure. Aggressive education program, educate consumers, educate teachers, educate government officials, educate business people. This fundamental philosophy here, community networks are about communication, not technology, this is the foundation of Twitch, the platform that we're on right now. The fact that community is about communication. It's not about the technology that you have. It's not about what camera you use. It's not about the microphone that you have. Those things are useful, but what brings people back to a Twitch channel is the community they find there. It's the content, it's the, the streamer, but it's not just the streamer alone. It is the streamer and the content. And so 
the modern platform that we're using today to build community and connect and have this digital community that in the case of Twitch ends up being a global community. Um, those fundamentals were present in the network infrastructure development of the Blacksburg Electronic Village back in the early 90s. And if you didn't know, my undergraduate degree is in community studies, so I, I know a little, I know a thing or two about uh, analyzing and talking about uh, communities um, and how they function and stuff like that. So the, this is this right in my wheelhouse, talking about community. Information tools, email for personal communications, World Wide Web, rich multimedia information source, Usenet, 8,000 plus discussion groups worldwide. Gopher, extensive information resource. So Gopher was one of the pre-Google information searching sources. Electronic directory, getting in touch with others. So electronic directory would have been similar to like an internet version of the phone book. So it'd be a directory service where it's a listing of web pages, essentially, um, that ultimately gets divided up by topic. So if you're looking for arts and entertainment, you would go there and get a listing of arts and entertainment web pages. We saw it on the Blacksburg Electronic Village website today, where you could go and there's a drop down and you could select music and get a listing of all the music businesses in Blacksburg. Uh, using advanced technology over, like video over the internet. Video over the internet. They're talking about video over the internet in the early 90s. Information infrastructure. Authorization and authentication services provided by Virginia Tech. Electronic mail provided by Virginia Tech. Gopher servers provided by Virginia Tech. Electronic directory provided by Virginia Tech. Network provided by c and and Virginia Tech. Future, self-sufficiency, no reliance on university resources. Encourage interested parties in the area, town of Blacksburg, commercial interests, to provide additional information services. <clears throat> and then we have a network diagram here, direct ethernet connections. Blacksburg Electronic Village, T1 based ethernet connections, May of 1995. So we have the internet, which is this amorphous cloud. Uh, today we're familiar with things in the cloud. Back then, the cloud was not really a metaphor that was used in the same way. Um, but in this illustration, the internet, that thing over there. There's a T1 lease line that connects Virginia Tech Commuting Computing Center to the internet. Then we have a T1 lease line, so that is a <clears throat> high-speed large data transfer line um, connecting the VT Computing Center to Bell Atlantic Central Office. Uh, Bell Atlantic being a telephone company. <clears throat> Bell Atlantic has leased lines, uh, so high-speed data focused um, telephone lines. <coughs> Pardon me. One second. I'm going to try and not cough anymore, and so I need a sip of water. <coughs> mm. Sorry. Uh, so they had um, direct data line services to the Montgomery Floyd Regional Library, the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and the uh, Blacksburg Electronic Village Office, Montgomery Floyd Regional Library, so two different locations I'm assuming for the library, six Montgomery County schools, and six local apartment complexes. So for 12 jacks here, 20 jacks there, 12 jacks here, 355 jacks there, and 575 ports in the apartment complexes.
making Blacksburg Electronic Village policy. BEV costs, much cheaper than commercial services, routers and subnets in apartments, private homes. BEV does not work on my computer. You need a fairly new machine, no more than two to three years old. Lack of staff to do testing. <clears throat> Sex and pornography. Community education about how the net works. So, Blacksburg Electronic Village Policy. Uh, I don't have the presentation notes, so I don't know specifically what was being talked about here, but we can infer and, and make assumptions. Uh, so, BEV costs, we know from the bullet point that they wanted to emphasize that this would be cheaper for the consumer than standard commercial services. Uh, they wanted to emphasize that this was available in your apartment and in your home. Uh, concerns about it not working on their computer, letting them know the technology requirements in order to be able to connect. So yes, it does need a fairly new machine. Um, and no, Blacksburg Electronic Village does not have a staff that can come to your home and check to see if your computer can handle it. So it requires a small level of techn technological experience to be able to determine if your computer can actually connect you to the network. And the final one there, sex and pornography, as we know, has been a major concern on the internet for various groups throughout the internet's history. Since it was made available to the public, there have been groups that have been concerned with access to sex and pornography over the internet. Uh, that was true in the early 90s, as it is true today. And so addressing that concern, because that would have been like the moral argument against creating this network. And uh, I think community education about how the net works, um, I'm not certain exactly what, what they're talking about there, but I think educating like about how this network, the Blacksburg Electronic Village was being set up and was not being set up with the purpose of serving that type of content and uh, that it was about community resources and what they intended to approve and allow on their site, um, emphasizing that, but then also just being real with people and letting them know once you have an internet connection, you can navigate the web and if you're looking for that stuff, you can find it. And that is not something that BEV would have any control over. Uh, that's my guess as to what they'd be talking about in that section, but I don't know because I don't have the presentation notes. Um, yes, DJ Phoenix, uh, the Avenue Q song, The Internet is for Porn, does indeed come to mind. Um, and had you caught me during one of my other streams, one of my gaming streams on my personal channel, I probably would sing it for you or at least part of it. A little surreal how closely this resembles diagrams of the futuristic net in cyberpunk books of the same era. Indeed, and, and so I would not be surprised if the authors of those cyberpunk books from the early and mid 90s looked at the Blacksburg Electronic Village to help design their online futuristic net for their books because this was cutting edge. But this was, uh, well, I, I wouldn't even say, I think cutting edge is not quite right. This is bleeding edge. This is ahead of the cutting edge. This is like the, the, the sharp tip of the cutting edge. This was really, really advanced for the time. This was the aspirational design that everyone was looking towards and had not yet figured out how to do. But this was being focused on a small community in an area with a lot of technical prowess and a lot of highly educated college associated people. So uh, by centering the project here in Blacksburg, 
they had a knowledge base of people who would be interested in using the internet. They had people who were mostly familiar with computers. They had people uh, who would have the buy-in for building the network. So it was kind of like a good place. Plus it was a small, relatively contained population, uh, 36,000 at the time. Um, so it, it's kind of like a proof of concept design for here's what the internet could be, building it out and, and basically running a test, a pilot test of something <clears throat> that could then be scaled to a larger city like say Richmond and then scaled from there to something along the lines of like Fairfax or Arlington or ultimately like Washington DC or New York or LA or etc. Um, but starting small in a place with a large, a, a, an, a disproportionate number in the population that are computer savvy and would want access to the internet um, and, you know, working with the municipality to make it a reality and, and do all of that. And ultimately, the network itself here was a success. That is ultimately not where public policy and um, the drives of capitalism ended up taking the internet on a global scale. Um, but for this area, what was built was used and was so well received by the community that it still exists today just as a website instead of a full municipal infrastructure project. Just got off a three hour call, so you missed a lot. Oh, it was not worth it. Um, I hope that you find the VOD interesting when you, um, when you go back and review it. We're looking at um, the Blacksburg Electronic Village, which was an early uh, municipal internet project, uh, launched in 1992, so bleeding edge technology, much ahead of uh, kind of the, the global, and, and, and it got headlines. It was called, Blacksburg was called the most wired town in, uh, in America because this project was aiming to connect everyone to the internet in the early 90s. Um, how it works. Blacksburg Electronic Village Office connects to the internet uh, and via wires to the CNP office, which is the telecom company, and through the phone lines to your modem and your computer. <laughs> uh, typical T1 installation. Let's see, community network issues. Administrative problems, swamp technical problems. Nightmare number one, a router in every home. Active rather than passive management. Email access transportability and IP address transportability. So, I love this. Nightmare number one, a router in every home. I'm not certain. I Again, we don't have the notes. Some biblical looking telephone poles. Um, honestly, I see that, but at the same time, that's an accurate representation of what telephone poles kind of look like in the area, or the older ones at least. Um, but yeah, no, I hadn't even noticed that. So I'm not sure exactly what they're getting at here, whether their nightmare would be BEV actually managing all those routers, which today, no. Absolutely not. Every individual person manages their own router for their house. I wonder if they were looking at, like, having their, like, central IT department trying to manage everybody's routers. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they needed more staff, DJ Phoenix. 
<laughs> Three steps to failure. One, tell yourself you need in-house experts. Two, hire the neighborhood hobbyist. It was cheap. Would you do that with print advertising? Three, don't be responsive to inquiries. I think, I think those steps to failure make sense. Tell yourself you need to hire somebody in-house who's an expert. If you can't afford to do that, then you got problems. Hired the neighborhood hobbyist because it was cheap. Nope, you want somebody that actually knows what they're doing. <laughs> Don't be responsive to inquiries. Indeed, you need to be responsive. <laughs> Stares at number one in IT professional. So I, I think these are interesting to look at. Um, it requires a little bit of knowledge of um, computer and internet technology at the time to be able to interpret what they're saying because these are just presentation slides essentially rather than having like their presentation notes or knowing what they were saying in the presentation. Um, but definitely still interesting to look at and review. Let's see. Building a community, and that's another presentation. I'm going to skip through some of the presentations. Uh, we've got about half an hour left. Uh, so I want to look at some of the media coverage. Um, I don't even know what's on these. I haven't listened to these. There's five audio cassettes in here um, that they've not been digitized. I don't know what's on them. Um, just Blacksburg Electronic Village and more. March 22nd, 94, cassette number two, cassette number one. Blacksburg Electronic Village and more. March 1st, 1994, cassette number one and cassette number two. And then this one is Blacksburg Electronic Village feature of 21.30 by George Hirsch for MDR Leipzig. Broadcast August, September 95. No idea. I don't have an audio cassette hooked into the, <coughs> or a, a audio cassette player hooked into the streaming setup, so I can't play these for you right now. Um, but I, I don't know. There's five audio cassettes in here. It seems like it'd be interesting. Broadcast uh, possibly like a radio show. Um, that was MDR Leipzig. So without listening to it, I don't know. And without listening to it, I don't know if it's in English or German. <laughs> um, and the uh, looking to see, that was folder 13. It doesn't say, it's just the title in the finding aid. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know if they even listened to it uh, when organizing it. They could have just read the label. Um, MDR is a German equivalent of NPR. Okay. That would make some sense. Somewhere in here I have um, an article from Der Spiegel Blacksburg, concept town. We have a photocopy. I don't know what color this image was. MDR is a radio and TV broadcaster in Germany. I'd assume a radio program in Germany. That's my guess. Uh, the fact that it listed Leipzig as the location, I'm assuming it's probably a program in German, but I, I don't know without uh, listening to the audio cassette because we don't have that recorded. Engineers Forum, 
April 1992. So this is from Engineers Forum magazine. <clears throat> Blacksburg Electronic Village, a community for the future by Mike Reese. The town of Blacksburg is slowly undergoing change which may make it one of the most futuristic societies in the world. Many people who pass through Blacksburg, Virginia associate the rural setting with a simple community. Few realize that Blacksburg is emerging into one of the most futuristic communities on the globe if a current feasibility study shows promise. This will be accomplished through the Blacksburg Electronic Village project. There are many areas of business and individual life which will be affected by this project. Primarily, life will be simpler due to the advanced technology being developed through the joint efforts of Virginia Tech, CNP Telephone, IBM, and obviously the town of Blacksburg. CNP is taking the lead in the six-month study of the idea. Final recommendations are expected in late summer. If implemented, the Electronic Village will revolutionize the role of computers in local schools. In Development is a National Research and Educational Network, NREN, which local schools will tie into through a Local Research and Educational Network, LREN. As more cities create LRENs, the national network will grow stronger. Joseph Weinko, uh, Joseph Venko, Wenko? I'm not sure how to pronounce this person's last name. I'm just going to go with one and move on. Joseph Venko, uh, manager at Communications Network Services, CNS, likens it to tributaries contributing to a river. Each LREN would be developed with personal attributes to better suit the community it serves. This network will access databases and other computers. Teachers will be able to call upon experts in various fields to give lectures and answer students' questions. Field trips can be taken without leaving the classroom. These are only a few of the in-school activities which will be made possible. At home, children will be able to access library material and other references. A sick pupil won't have to miss assignments or turn in, uh, turn in homework late. In an optimum situation, the student won't even have to miss school. A computer could connect the child to the teacher and the rest of the class. I'm just going to pause for a second there. This was the imagination of what was possible with the internet. None of this existed uh, in 1992 when this article was written. This was flights of fancy. This was science fiction of oh, a student is sick, so they stay at home, but are still able to attend class via the internet. Which hits very differently today, after the last 19 months, uh, 20 months or so, um, where the entire world lived for almost a year fully remote and accessing the entire world via the internet. <laughs> but can it send electronic mail? <laughs> yes, Simsilica, it can. <laughs> um, so, 1992, science fiction, like, here's the potential of this system that is being installed. Um, and wouldn't this be amazing? kind of approach in this in this article and here we are 2021 and the world literally just spent an entire year living this as truth uh, the quality of local libraries will not be a limiting factor when children gather resources for projects Material from lending universities and distant cities will be available to them. The power of the computer to ac and access to a multitude of software will, will enable children to work at their own pace while the teacher easily monitors and evaluates their work. The students of Blacksburg will be given the first opportunity to take advantage 
uh, of the most efficient and productive educational program in the country, while their parents utilize a different function of the electronic village. I will say, I doubt that most teachers would say that they easily monitor and evaluate the work of students uh, via online instruction. Um, but I think that most teachers, like what this is proposing, the power of the computer to access a multitude of software to enable children to work at their own pace while the teacher easily evaluates, uh, that has not been the use that computers actually were, were put to. They're talking about potential here, and certainly the, the networks had that potential. Uh, but our educational systems never shifted to use them in that way. So while the potential was there, the drastic shift to online education in early 2020 um, didn't make this a reality in the way it's described here because instruction had been geared towards in-person instruction. All of the teacher's training was geared towards in-person instruction. All of the lesson plans that had been developed and the techniques designed for instructional purposes were geared towards in-person instruction and could not be rapidly shifted to online instruction, which requires a different set of tools and a different preparation, um, possibly even a different lesson plan in order to teach the same topics. Uh, quality instruction via online instruction is possible, but requires different preparation. And that was not, there was not the opportunity to retool courses for online instruction when the world suddenly shifted to online in March of 2020. Um, so while this talks about a potential that was there to make things easier for all around, uh, I think we discovered last year that it takes more than just putting the tools in place. It takes actual community commitment to changing the way things are done in order to make that successful. <clears throat> um, the accessibility of different social events and the interaction of people on a network open up new dimensions for socializing. Anyone with a computer will be able to attain information on social gatherings of their peer or ethnic groups. Information that needs to be dispersed quickly, such as a cancellation of class or team practice, can be sent through a network instead of letting your fingers do the walking across the yellow pages. A consumer's fingers can walk across the keyboard and explore a more in-depth uh, directory of businesses, sign up for sports facilities, or answer general questions about different restaurants. So again, fully speculation. Uh, let your fingers do your walking was one of the, uh, or let your fingers do the walking was um, a kind of catchphrase, advertising phrase for a telephone book printer uh, at the time. So the yellow pages, let your fingers do the walking, that, that would have rung true to consumers reading this article. Um, and so a consumer's fingers can walk across the keyboard and explore a more in-depth directory of businesses, sign up for sports facilities, answer general questions about different restaurants. So um, <clears throat> I'm not certain what sign up for sports facilities is specifically referring to, but I guess like today you could reserve, uh, reserve a spot at your local tennis court or racquetball court or um, you know, reserve the community basketball room at the local community center online. Like that's all possible today, uh, depending on whether they've integrated a uh, reservation system into their website or not. Um, uh, envisioned here. Uh, answer general questions about different restaurants. Oh my gosh, Yelp. Like, they're describing Yelp in 92. Yelp didn't exist, but this is Yelp, or, or like Google reviews of restaurants. Cancellation of classes, yeah, online. 
um, just, just sending out a notice, an email or, or, or like a uh, group text or something. Uh, I guess group me is uh, the tool that a lot of, um, it gets a lot of use here at Virginia Tech. It's a, a, an app called group me where if the professor needed to cancel last minute, they could just pop a post into group me and the class would know that class was canceled. Um. <laughs> What's next? Ordering stuff online? <laughs> the keyboard can also help a consumer order information more quickly than placing the order across the phone or through the mail. Every day, a business person will have the opportunity to order a different newspaper to best suit their needs. Reading the news can be done at their desk. This is convenient for the consumer and beneficial for the environment. Yes and no, but uh, let's keep reading. And instead of delving into the environmental implications of transferring print media to the internet, um, access to newspapers from around the world like, that is the reality today. But at the time, newspapers weren't delivered over the internet. You got a physical paper in your mailbox. If you wanted to subscribe to um, the New York Times, you likely would get the paper, like here in, in Blacksburg, I'm uh, specifically saying, if you subscribe to the New York Times, you would get the paper a couple of days after it was printed because it took that long to get here. They didn't have like a local distribution office for the New York Times here. The local paper was, you got the Roanoke Times uh, or the, I think it's the Blacksburg News Messenger. Um, and there's a lo another local paper in the area called the Burg, uh, referring to Blacksburg and Christiansburg. Um, <clears throat> but for something like the New York Times, unless you lived in New York or another major metropolitan area where they had a printer to print the, the paper, you didn't get access to it until days later. Uh, you can read a printed newspaper at your desk too. Yeah, it's an odd thing to call out. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. Uh, larger, um, large amounts of paper will not be wasted in the production of newspaper. Information will be instead saved electronically. Our own library is in the midst of transferring to this type of system. CD-ROM now holds current information on disk instead of paper. Oh boy, whole, whole layer of environmental issues related with CD-ROMs. But again, let's not dive into that at the moment. Um, this is a really interesting article. Electronically saving information not only saves paper, but also space and time. One can easily save time referencing information on a disk from a remote area. Space is saved because a disk takes up considerably less space than a book. Presently, there is a group which is converting classic novels and other works into electronic editions. I would be curious to know which, which group they were talking about there whether that's Project Gutenberg or something else. I don't know when Project Gutenberg started. Um, anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead, look at some more, see more coverage. Um, but that's a really interesting article that's in here. Um, what is this? I don't see the reference the pages from time, but I don't see a reference to BEV. So we'll skip that one. It is so immature at this point, a large portion of the problem and effort was in the physical infrastructure and getting everything connected. The rest at this point is theoretical use cases, which required evolution in developing applications to take advantage of. Yes, yes. So the, at this time, like, those were theoretical. Those were um, just people envisioning what was possible with the technology. <clears throat> so that reference to reviewing restaurants, 
that was entirely theoretical. That was entirely just, imagine you could do this with this technology. Um, and it took decades after that for Yelp to be introduced and actually make that a reality. Um, and some things didn't turn out the way that they envisioned because life happened and either some other interest got involved that prevented it from developing the way that it was envisioned. Like, you can have ideas, you can imagine, you that's, that's essentially the same type of um, hypotheticals that science fiction authors are doing. They look at the technology, they see where might this go in another few years, and they write about it as science fiction. Some of it becomes real and some of it doesn't. But it's, it's all extrapolation into the future of, of the potential for the technology. Wiki said, Project Gutenberg started in the 70s. By the mid-1990s, Hart was running Project Gutenberg from Illinois Benedictine College. More volunteers had joined the effort. He manually entered all of the text until 1989, when image scanners and optical character recognition software improved and became more available, making book scanning more feasible. Thank you, Fluidan. So I would guess that that art article was probably referring to Project Gutenberg then, uh, with regard to the um, digitization of books. Um, let's see. Want to see. As far as media, I remember in the late 90s, a coworker had an article printed out on their cube wall about how the world was going to move to a paperless office. The article was 20 years old at that point. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yep. <clears throat> Let's see, I want to see... Let's look into see... Oh, we have an article from Playboy magazine. Um, I will be previewing the pages before sharing them on stream. <clears throat> <laughs> Your desk still has a lot of, my desk has lots of paper on it, but then again, I'm an archivist. So, <laughs> January 1994, Playboy magazine. Plugged in the Blacksburg way. A city, a university, and a phone company have joined forces to give us a glimpse of the future. In an experiment dubbed the Electronic Village, Officials of Blacksburg, Virginia, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, and the CNP Telephone Company are offering residents the opportunity to be linked to local government offices, teachers, healthcare providers, and other businesses by way of computer. 42 miles of fiber optic cable were laid to get the first 1,000 participants online late in 1993. Now users can send electronic mail messages around town access a database of more than one million documents, and view a town directory of services and meeting calendars. Future options will include banking and bill paying by computer, medical communications with local doctors, class registration, and more. Developers of Blacksburg's Electronic Village see it as a worldwide model for 21st century communications. A somewhat similar experimental city is underway in Telluride, Colorado. Oh, that's the entire thing from Playboy. Sorry, no images for you. <laughs> but it was it was in Playboy magazine in 1994. Um, selling magazine. I don't know what selling magazine is. I've, the front lines of business. I've never heard of that. Business Week. <clears throat> Business Week. May 24th, 1993. On the superhighway to the Electronic Village. Computer industry pundits have long said that in the future people will be able to hold town meetings, make appointments with their doctors, or even rent a video, all using personal computers connected via high-capacity fiber optic cable.
But for some residents of tiny Blacksburg, Virginia, such a network will be available by this summer. The Blacksburg Electronic Village is a pilot program designed by the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University not only to connect students living off campus with the university's computer network, but also to study the intricacies of running a digital information superhighway. CNP Telephone, the local baby bell, and project partner has committed over $6.5 million in fiber optic cable, networking equipment, and services. The setup is also available to Blacksburg's local residents, businesses, and elementary schools, creating a true community. Paul Gehrman, a project director for Virginia Tech, says he's trying to sign up outside networks such as CompuServe to give the Electronic Village global reach. <clears throat> Me trying to do a fun, like, newscastery voice. I don't know if it translated, but it was fun for me. Let's see. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Selling power, rural users' expectations. Because I had it in the tweet, I want to see if I can find the Der Spiegel one, just to show it to you. I can't read German either. Um, net guide. Oh, you all can't see what I'm flipping through here. Issues and opinions. Time Magazine. Welcome to cyberspace. I'm assuming we're in this Spring 1995, Time Magazine. You just needed the ticker tape sound in the background. Thank you. <laughs> um, is there a table of contents? I'm starting to get to know this music now. Very Walter Winchell-esque, thank you. There's not a table of contents? Oh, here we are. I do not know which of these would be the one. Uh, maybe page 30? I'm assuming that because nope, I don't know. Uh, this issue, Spring '95 issue of Time Magazine, apparently has coverage of the Blacksburg Electronic Village in it, but I don't know exactly where, and we don't have a lot of time left. So press time. Information Revolution, U.S. Air Magazine. Lots of magazine coverage. Um, which one was it? I think it was in 97 where we had the Der Spiegel article that I used for the... Tweet. Uh, alumni Associate. Der Spiegel. Again, I don't read German, but... There's a translation. So I will show you all. Um, this is Der Spiegel from the 10th of November, 1997, I believe. And we get Das Blocksburg Experiment. You got the head of Blacksburg Electronic Village sitting on top of, like sitting on the roof of the BEV building. <clears throat> the Blacksburg Experiment. How our life changes when most people are connected will be watched in the American town of Blacksburg. Two thirds of the inhabitants have connected their computer to the internet and will in the future test its everyday suitability. In each other small city, Bill Ellenbogen had a, uh, 
Wait, in each other small city, Bill El Ellen Bogan had a new Firebird parked in front of his house, or a Trans Am, or something else with four tires and much exhaust gas, which, for a tolerable amount of money, guaranteed the most possible horsepower and prestige. With it, he would run up and down the streets until he made the neighbors green from envy and the exhaust gas. But Bill lives in Blacksburg, Virginia. Here, one does not buy an auto when he wants to annoy his neighbors. Here, one buys a computer. At best, one with a Pentium processor and a T1 internet connection. This guarantees as much sensation as a Chrysler Viper and hits each modem and each ISDN-driven computer. Early this year, it was time. Bill put some money together and bought himself a computer. And because one with a computer can hardly run up and down the streets, Bill parked it on a table in the middle of his cafe and let it amaze him. When the first excitement had died down, the 1.5 million bits per second were processed and again the mouth was open. Bill then installed a video camera and drew a plastic protection cover over the keys and then there was beer. Sorry, you have to see the picture of Bill with the beer. <clears throat> the fact that in Blacksburg a computer possesses more prestige than a reasonably good appearing large series sports wagon is the unintentional result of an experiment that Blacksburg University, Virginia Tech, began four years ago. At that time, Andrew uh, Cohill got the order to lead the Blacksburg citizens into the internet and to make the town the most networked place in the world. Cohill is a slender assistant professor who hides behind strong glasses and drives a beat-up Mazda pickup. In addition, he is an information architect. Information architects attempt to design computer programs so that they are cozy as homes and simple to use as a toaster without an on switch button. Uh, mostly the attempt fails. One sees that on Andrew's pinched mouth and on the number of copies of computer handbooks. In order to make Blacksburg the most networked town in the world, Cohill must not only set up computer programs, but must lift the whole town into the internet. The schools, the businesses, the houses. In addition, the town hall, the bookstores, the local television station, both golf courses and the Natural History Museum. That should change the town into a 49 square kilometer open air laboratory and give the university a prestigious research project and make Blacksburg famous and modern. Up to now, the town has only one great success. It belongs to the 20 cities or towns in which retired Americans best like to live. To lift the public buildings into the internet was only a question of technology, but to fill the Blacksburgers with enthusiasm for the experiment would cost Cohill more, more time than he had and more keyboards than he thought. The internet in 1993 for programmers was an indip indispensable tool. With the help of the internet, he found research results in seconds instead of weeks. He could work with computers, um, which were f over 20 flying hours in an Australian laboratory without leaving his chair. For non-programmers, the internet at that time was as interesting as the Gobi Desert at night. On a black screen shined a little light. There were no colored buttons to click on and no windows that jumped up. Commands must be typed pedantically, and the answers were as understandable as chassis numbers of an auto, and also looked so. That all changed with the discovery of a chubby student. Mark Anderson discovered the Netscape Navigator, and with the program, the net became colorful and clickable. The American intellectuals discovered it, the politicians, the economy, the media, and in a few months, the internet moved up from the edge of public interest into the center and became unreal hopes of the projectionist areas. Or unreal hopes to the projectionist areas. It promised now more knowledge, more democracy, more wealth, more work, more free time. A book that celebrated the paradigm change from Adam to Bit, published to the top of the American bestseller list and the House of Representatives cho choose a speaker who cuts the education funds of the states and Medicaid, ha who however wants to introduce homeless children to the internet. But entrance to the internet would cost money. The Blacksburgers needed computers, modems, and for the access, the university spent 8.6 spent $8.6 a month. I'm...
That is what it says. Uh, which was not a little in a town in which the families earn 19000 a year, 1500 less than the state average. In the beginning, Cohill attempted to prove the worth of the internet with long technical words. He stuck to the effort. Cohill learned that the presentation must be short and understandable. Since then, right after the greeting, he throws a 102 keyboard into the garbage can, holds up a mouse with buttons and says, you need no more than this to master the internet, which is sensational, but true. And then one of the Blacksburgers asks, what do I need the internet for? Cohill answers uh, with a counter question, what are you interested in? The answers of the Blacksburgers, among others, the story of the Rolling Stones, current stock market, quilting, Verdi's stif uh, Stifelio, jokes over Brig Green, jokes over big green autos, the Bambi killers, the weather on the Beale Air Force Base in California. Andrew clicked with his mouse and showed places on the internet where information on the stones, the stock market, quilting, and the rest of the net, uh, and the weather on the California Air Base are findable. 24 degrees Celsius and gusty winds out of the Northwest are not world moving, which are enough to mess up side parted hair. But if the, f but if the far away sun stands in the wind, it is nice to know that he is not freezing. And if there are tips of Bambi killers and the newest quilting trends, uh, it is worth $8 and 60 cents a month for many Blacksburgers. Up to now, Cohill with the library representative, Walter Zicke, uh, have won over 24,000 Blacksburgers to the two-thirds of the 34,000 Blacksburgers have connected their computers to the internet and over half of all firms Cohill w has fulfilled his task. Blacksburg is the most networked town or city of the world. In Stockholm, New York, Tokyo, and many other big cities have more people on the internet, but nowhere in the world is the percentage higher than in Blacksburg. This superlative has won the town a place in the widely courted 24-hour cyberspace project, uh, many TV interviews and visits from eager to learn Japanese. They are relocating very resolutely in their own land, glass fiber cables, connecting computers to the internet and wanting to taste what will happen when the future meets the everyday. The hope in Blacksburg for more democracy disappeared first. Part of the Blacksburg experiment are local pol political discussions on the internet, called the town chats. The Blacksburgers have the possibility to meet in a computer with their town manager, but only a few do that. For in the beginning, the discussions suffered from the fact that they had no themes. The Blacksburgers could only greet the town manager and ask what came into their heads. Therefore, they asked about a snow road for the smart road and about fees for auto registration. Oh, we'll have to talk about the smart road sometime. Uh, later, there were themes, for example, the new bicycle path in the town, uh, but that interested only a few Blacksburgers. Meanwhile, the town manager knew that the internet does not make boring themes interesting, it on only it makes access to interesting themes easy. Andrew Cohill wouldn't stoop to contacting sex and homosexual groups on the internet. He was not concerned about freedom of speech and blocked access to the internet to the Blacksburg residents. No one protested publicly. In Blacksburg, there are 48 church congregations. When town manager Ron Seacrest agreed to the Blacksburg experiment, he hoped not only uh, he hoped not only on more local democracy, but also on more employment. Seacrest dreamed that his town would be the national test market for the internet, and the Blacksburgers would test the program. Firms would build new branches in Blacksburg, or no matter what, pull closer. But over that, nothing could be done. The Blacksburg population is not representative enough. Over half of the Blacksburgers are students. Today, Seacrest can point to three handfuls of concerns with one, two, three employees who build internet pages and buy computers and software. The proprietor of the Wade Regional Supermarket hoped to earn money through the internet. He proposed to his customers, you can order your whole supply through the internet. We will pack everything in bags and you collect it and pay not a penny in addition. The idea pleased many Blacksburgers. They bought online, but only once. Only two customers bought for a long time. A professor at the university and Andrew Cohill, uh, Dave McIntyre, data processing manager, believes it was before its time. Cohill believes that is nonsense. More advertising would certainly convince the public. 
They buy, indeed, couch coverings which administer electric shocks to hairy dogs. Only a few pairs of services, some knowledge, and much digital trash remain from the great hopes. The Blacksburgers can tell their police station when they leave the town, so that the patrols can keep an eye on their houses. And they can ask the cardiologist J. Edwin Wilder about strange sounds in their hearts. Both the Blacksburgers, both the Blacksburgers could do before, but they must post a guard and sit down in the waiting room and read old magazines. Now that all comes from the living room. In all, Blacksburg's school children can work with the internet and learn from it that zero degrees centigrade in Finland is 32 degrees Fahrenheit in the schoolyard. And the Blacksburgers can write electronic letters, and they do just that. 24,000 online Blacksburgers wrote 250,000 letters per day. The electronic mail is so beloved because it saves time and is fast. Speed is modern, and modern pleases the Blacksburgers. Instead of sitting with a friend in Bill's Cafe in an old-fashioned way with, some, with time to forget and talk, rather the Blacksburgers sit in front of their computers 78 minutes a day and type fleeting letters to as many acquaintances as possible. A group of Blacksburgers especially treasure the speed of the email, on which Cohill had not calculated, the retirees. They write without pause about wrens, which always more rarely hop through gardens, complain about broken hips and prostate troubles. They tell Stone Age jokes. They also tell also when the last wrens are driven off, enjoy the feeling to be bonded with others, and hurry like the usual Blacksburgers through their accelerated everyday life. And the Blacksburgers, who also want to save more time in order to live more breathlessly, use digital letter copies which, with a click, send each email to hundreds of receivers. One question dominates the letters. How can I get my computer to be faster? <laughs> um, interesting. So that was the article from Der Spiegel uh, translated to English. Um, <laughs> eight dollars and sixty cents per person. Yeah, yes, not for the entire system. Eighteen dollars in twenty twenty one money. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is where we're going to leave the Blacksburg Electronic Village for today. There's a lot more in this collection, as especially media coverage, but also more presentations about it, um, network infrastructure things. Um, etc. There's, there's actually, I mean, it's two relatively small boxes, but there's a lot of information in here, and it is, it is quite the gem for anyone who's interested in sort of the early idea of uh, a community internet, um, uh, early like local networks for for computers, or is just interested in early internet generally. Um, but that is where we're going to leave uh, that topic for today. I'm just going to double check because my brain has already forgotten what we're doing next week. And I do want to um, plug that before we go. Um, but what did you all think? Did you find that to be uh, an interesting collection? It's just one that's been sitting there for a while and has been on my list for a little, a little bit. Um, Next week, we're going to be looking at some of the smaller collections that we have for some pioneering women architects. Um, so that's coming from our International Archive of Women in Architecture. Um, it'll be a part one because we're definitely going to revisit that collection, although not immediately following it. But um, I'll call it part one because there will be a part two where we look at more influential uh, pioneering women architects in the future. Um, but that is the plan for next week. Let me go ahead and see who we're going to raid um, because we are going to do a raid. Um, but yeah, I do want to thank everybody for stopping by um, and it, just hanging out while I explored what is local history here, but is also global history and, and is the history of the internet. Um, so thank you so much for coming by for that. Um, and, you know, you can probably guess who I'm going to end up raiding uh, because, 
yeah, I have limited access to do raids uh, from both channels, and I like to take both channels to the same place. So we are definitely going to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They are showing jellyfish today, so just a heads up on that. Um, but they are a wonderful educational uh, uh, organization, um, uh, aquarium, <laughs> um, that streams live uh, some of the wildlife out there, and they're a nice chill stream to follow this up with. Uh, so I'm happy to support them. I'm going to go ahead and set up that raid. Um, for both channels. And again, I just want to say thank you for coming by and uh, joining me for Archival Adventures. I will be live again next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time for another Archival Adventures. Um, like I said, we'll be looking at uh, pioneering women architects from the International Archive of Women in Architecture. I hope to see you then. Um, and yeah, until then, um, I hope that you have a good day and uh, you know, I will see you sometime. <laughs>